condition. At times, the illness or injury uh, can be taken care of with an injection of something called solutortef, and it must be administered quickly without this injection or additional oral medication. The otherwise non-urgent condition could actually become life-threatening. We could see circulatory collapse, heart or organ failure, seizures, brain damage, etc. Mr. Chairman, this is an issue in our elementary schools that we are trying to address, but I want to make sure everybody on the subcommittee understands something. We are not mandating that a nurse goes and takes training in this bill. Do we want them to be trained? Absolutely. Do we want them to be properly trained? Yes. But I want to be clear in the bill before you, in lines 146 through 155, you will see that this says that an individual may ask a nurse or other uh, individual within the private school or the public school who is trained and then who does administer the injections will not be liable to any civil damages or ordinary negligence in acts or admissions resulting from rendering the treatment. Mr. Chairman, this is in the category of the Good Samaritan Law. You've got someone who's trained. You've got someone who administers. They do everything they're supposed to do right. We cannot then go and expect to hold them liable for those civil, civil damages. Those civil damages sometimes create a chilling effect and ultimately, we don't have time in this sort of circumstance for people to be hesitant in their action. Mr. Chairman, I brought some um, advocates to testify. They will be very brief and will not trespass on your time, but it's such an important issue. They've come a long way. I'd ask Mr. Chairman, with your indulgence, that they might say a few words. I don't agree, so let's hear from those folks, and then we'll entertain questions for the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.
Um, any person with an adrenal insufficiency, regardless of cause, is at risk for suffering from an adrenal crisis. It's a life-threatening condition, um, often brought on by stress, such as an accident, injury, or illness. So, for instance, if a child is out on the playground playing and breaks an arm, if a child becomes ill at school, has vomiting and diarrhea, develops a fever from an ear infection, they are at risk for going into adrenal crisis. Um, under such circumstances, children and adults with uh, adrenal insufficiency, renal insufficiency require an immediate injection of cortisol, cortisol, which comes in the form of a drug called salicortec. It's a harmless drug because it is a, a hormone that our body produces naturally. And so even if you give this drug and a child does not need it, it is not going to harm them. It's a simple and safe injection. But delaying the administration of Cyuportep by even just minutes can cause irreversible, irreversible injury, such as brain damage, organ failure, and even death. The national standards protocol for a person experiencing an adrenal crisis is to administer Cyuportep first and then activate the emergency medical system. Um, timely administration is of utmost importance in avoiding irreversible injury or death. As I've stressed, it is so important to administer this in a timely manner at the first signs of an adrenal crisis. If school personnel and EMS are not able to administer this drug, there is a significant delay between the beginning of symptoms and the arrival to a hospital emergency room. All children deserve an education in a safe and secure environment where their parents can send them every day and not fear that they may not come back to them. Second, to report the bill. Any further discussion? Hearing none. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Bill's reported. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Members of the subcommittee. Delegate Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my bill is House Bill number 
a guest today can help future generations of deaf people finally get jobs because they are able to read and write. Under the current system, this is not happening. The average deaf or hard of hearing student graduates from high school with a third or fourth grade reading level, gratefully due to language exposure, lack of language exposure, or language deprivation. By the age of five, a child's brain is 90% developed, yet most deaf and hard of hearing children enter kindergarten without language. And 51% of deaf and hard of hearing students score at the far below basic level, which is the lowest performance, lowest level of performance on tests. I want to offer this solution to change this. This bill is key to ensure each deaf child gets the language acquisition foundation for kindergarten readiness, ending over 130 years of language deprivation and dismal as educational scores. All deaf and hard of hearing babies are born ready to learn. I was born ready to learn, but I wasn't given full access to a language. During my time, no one really understood what language acquisition was. It is painful to be language deprived, and I want the future generations of deaf children to have more opportunities than I did. The baby's brain grows up to three times its size during the first two years. By the age of five, the baby's brain is almost completed with its growth. Those are crucial years for the child to acquire language or languages. It's not being deaf that calls, causes babies and children to be language deprived. It's the lack of full access to acquiring the language as well as the lack of language acquisition milestones that cause <coughs> language deprivation. Too often parents don't know about the child's lack of language acquisition until they learn that their child is falling behind academically in, in elementary school. <laughs> language acquisition after the age of five is too late. Too late for kindergarten readiness. The clock cannot be turned back. If you look at the current overall educational data for deaf children, it's dismal. This is because of language deprivation, which is preventable. Not that it is not acceptable that parents often do not know that their deaf child is language deprived until elementary school, especially by the third grade or later when it's too late. Ma'am, could you start to wrap up, please? I'm sure there are other people who want to speak. We are almost finished. <clears throat> a parent has a right to know about their child's language acquisition milestones from ages zero to five. Now is the time for language acquisition accountability for all deaf children in Virginia. It's time for, for Virginia to have kindergarten ready deaf children. Mead K has come up with a solution to break the cycle of language deprivation and a low educational scores. Give the parents of language acquisition milestones from the time the child is identified with hearing loss at birth until age five. Your vote today can help future generations of deaf people to finally get jobs because they are able to read and write. And again, under the current system, this is not happening. Deaf children cannot wait until tomorrow for language acquisition. If you ask yourselves who benefits from this bill, it's the deaf children and it's their parents. If you ask yourselves who will not benefit, you have to stop and think. If you look at language deprivation in Wikipedia, you will find five names of people in that history. One of them is a child psychiatrist in Boston who sees three to five people every day who are language deprived. And I'm begging you please to keep this bill intact. Thank you for your time. If there are others who wish to speak in support of you, you're welcome to come to the podium and just tell us uh, if you support the bill. I, I apologize that we're in this time crunch, but that's where we are. And let me just tell you that uh, uh, you don't have a stronger advocate in this General Assembly than me. I'm an advocate for the deaf community, always have been. Uh, and 
so I, I appreciate what you're what you're doing and what you're saying. I just don't have time to hear from everyone. Good morning. My name is Star Greaser. I am from Hampton Roads area in Virginia. I came all the way this morning, and I just want to ask you all to please support this bill, 1873. This is your opportunity to truly make a huge impact for deaf and hard of hearing children in the future. Thank you. Dr. Rhonda Jennings Ayers. I'm a teacher of the deaf, and honestly, this is a hugely important bill. I see so much of this every day, and I ask you to please support this bill to make a huge difference. Thank you. Virginia. Thank you. The Virginia Association of the Centers for Independent Living Support. I'm sorry, we're, really, we're going to have to.
obviously, to um, enhance and, and provide more money uh, inside the program. But what has happened is, is about a third of the students who are qualified, um, because mostly because schools can't make the matching funds, aren't getting the state part of the funds, and therefore aren't providing a service to these, uh, to these children. Uh, I'm carrying this bill for Prince William County, but I think the biggest benefactors are many of the, the really small communities. So I'm asking uh, the committee to pass the bill so that we are for the bill so we can uh, um, eliminate the, the matching funds. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dale. Do you have a delegate Lingham? wish to speak to the bill. Hearing and seeing none, uh, subcommittee, what's your budget? Move to report. Move and properly seconded to report the bill. Is there further discussion? And hearing none, all in favor, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, same sign. Bill's report. Thank you, Delegate Duden. Delegate Fodercorn. Members of the committee, I have two bills before you. Which one would you like to take first? Uh, let's see. HB 2406, please. Okay. House Bill 2406. Thank you. This is a very simple bill. I've had the opportunity to be with you about this. Uh, this focuses, it, what this bill would do is add instruction, uh, privacy, and respect to our um, FLA curriculum in all levels of public education, elementary, middle, and high school. And it's very simple. Basically, right now, as it stands, the only place where we actually teach respect and boundaries and other people's privacy is taught in early elementary school. And uh, there's nothing later. And I think, as we all see, there's been a strong increase in bullying and other, other instances around the country, and certainly around the Commonwealth of Virginia. And in fact, just last week, we all were supportive of the bill and heard testimony from an individual that I brought here sharing his. Uh, personal experience with bullying. Um, and I think what this bill would do, what, what I, in, in, through my research, as I looked at what exactly was already listed, what are we currently doing, 
I was surprised to see that um, in kindergarten, we mentioned this once as it relates to bathroom facilities. In first, first grade, we mentioned this in the curriculum also one of what says, quote, aware of the effects of his or her behavior or others, and effects on others' behaviors on him or himself. Third grade, we mentioned the student shall describe the types of behavior that enable him or her to gain or lose friends. And that's really the extent of it. I think clearly we all recognize that bullying is an issue, and it's increasing in the number of instances around the Commonwealth, and it also increases with age. And I think it's great to start earlier. What this bill does is merely add to the curriculum that we're going to focus on behavior, focus on privacy, <coughs> respecting one's privacy, and the age appropriate, appropriate and um, evidence-based uh, matter. And uh, the work of many organizations, many groups, there's no known um, opposition. They're working with the Family Foundation and Education Association and SARA and um, also Virginia Catholic uh, Conference as well. And again, I don't believe there's any known opposition, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Delegate Fuller. For any other questions from the subcommittee? Do one of the audience wish to speak to the bill? I'm here with Virginia Assembly Independent Baptist. I understand and applaud what efforts are being done, and I'm not speaking in opposition or support for this measure. My concern is we're trying to teach family education when it ought to come from the family. We need to be teaching values of character and respect, which I know is the effort of what they're trying to do. But sometimes we're teaching situation ethics, which is not the right solution. There should be a clear understanding of what right and what wrong is. And so uh, what some people think is personal privacy, others they think, I don't understand. Uh, but I just say, I know you're trying to do your best, and I know she's trying to fix a problem, help with this problem as well. But I'm just really concerned that we're not going in the right direction. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, that, that pretty much reflects my sentiment about uh, and my concern about this particular piece of legislation. All, all these things are very well intended. It's not, it's not about not being well intended. The question is, and I ask myself, how was I able to teach my children these things without the government telling me that I need to teach my children these things? And I do think that see more of these behavioral things taken care of in the, well, I hope that it is. I know you might not agree, but I do hope that, that it does. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, we need to depend on our families to do these sorts of things and, and ask our educators to do what educators are supposed to do, which is focus on the academics to get our kids ready to be successful. So I appreciate your sentiment.
simple for us. We think um, understanding personal space, privacy, and boundaries are essential skills to the building blocks of healthy relationships in all aspects of children and youth lives, and that caring adults in all areas of kids' lives, from the home to the schools to aftercare programs, the importance of reinforcing um, these healthy skills, which are really, really the building blocks of healthy relationships in all aspects of our lives. And we would ask that you would support this legislation. And I'd like to take a moment, this is our advocacy day, and we have folks um, from across the Commonwealth who are here today in support of this legislation who um, also do work with children and youth in all aspects of their lives. And I'd like to ask them to stand to show their support of this legislation. tell you that in the 21st century, it's not happening in every home. And I'll also tell you, as a former teacher, that unless they have this training, unless we can help them get it, and provide them with those necessary soft skills, everything else you try to do as a teacher is like spinning your wheels in the snow. So, of their choices, their community choices, and that decision and selection of actual materials is made um, at the school division level. Thank you. Anyone else wish to comment? <coughs> Subcommittee operates by motion. Mm -hmm. 
moved and properly seconded to report the bill. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none. All in favor of reporting, please raise your right hand. Those opposed, same sign. Bill reports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Delegate Fillerthorn, you also have House Bill 2257, I believe. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, HB 2257, again, focused on uh, the family life education. And uh, again, this is a fairly simple, clear bill. This focuses on teaching consent in an age appropriate, evidence based manner. I think uh, we have all heard and hear on a regular basis instances of assault and abuse too often. And um, even as we move forward with legislation here, and I think. Um, majority, if not all of you have supported some, some of our legislation um, towards this end in the last session, I think we realize that we can do better. And often starting and teaching at a younger age would help tremendously. So talking again about age appropriate, evidence based, we're talking about permission here. Um, many of you, I had the opportunity to discuss this bill with you and you asked with regard to the definition of consent, what is that? What we're talking about here is permission. And again, it's all about age appropriate evidence based. So we have, um, so whether you're talking about kindergarten or you're talking about second grade versus high school, the definition is going to change, the examples will change. And um, right now, and I know a lot of you wanted to know well, what do we currently do? It's in the FLEs. In 10th grade, we talk about it once, and that's really it. So all this bill is doing is, is focusing on high school, saying, let's talk about this in ninth. 10th and 11th, 12th grade. Um, once, one time earlier, again, focusing focusing on permission. I hope it will be the pleasure of this body to pass this bill. Any other questions for the paper? Delegate for money. Yes, 
um, we are currently um, under uh, this section, specifically Section B, we are focused on teaching age-appropriate element-based elements of effective and evidence-based programs on dating violence, domestic abuse, sexual harassment, sexual violence. It does not mention consent, so this would be merely adding consent, which again, you know, defined as permission. But in ninth grade now, we are teaching these other uh, things to look out for. Is that correct? Yes. short on time, I will uh, entertain very brief comments if anyone wants to speak to the bill. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Sherry Owen, I'm the Director of Outreach at SARA, the Sexual Assault Resource Agency. Again, as Zelia Thorborn said, um, all we're doing is asking is this can be started in ninth grade. And what it's doing, again, is it's just asking that we um, add asking permission and is defining the word consent. I'm sure that in all of the classes that I teach, and I'm sure that you've taught your kids and grandkids the importance of asking permission, all we're doing is, is adding that into the curriculum and showing the importance of that to go along with um, the rest of the family life curriculum. Thank you. Again, Mr. Chair, members of the community, Christine Hall, State Action Alliance, I just wanted to add a couple of things and I'll be brief. The, the first is, one of the elements of adding consent is that this is a positive term associated with skills necessary for healthy relationships. So while we talk about avoiding um, dating violence and how to recognize this and avoid it, I think adding consent is a proactive step towards the, the building blocks necessary for healthy relationships. And then with respect to adding it throughout the entire high school realm as well as for the family, what's part of the home and teaching in school is there's a lot of research about the importance of saturation around the development of these skills and how that's really how they become the foundation um, of relationships and that sprinkling, just getting this once in 10th grade or maybe once in third grade is not enough. It needs to be reinforced over and over and over again to really take hold for students. So we would ask that you support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone on the subcommittee have further comments? <coughs> Um, you know, I, theoretically, I, you know, dating violence, domestic abuse, all of these are negative terms, except for consent being a positive term. And I, I just want to make sure that how you know how this is taught is not that by giving consent, all of these things are okay because they're not okay. And so I wonder about how it would be taught. Um, in context, and I'm sure, you know, the answer would be to be taught that it's not okay. But I don't know, it's so broad that we're just going to have any consent. How are we going to teach, what are we going to teach about consent in context to the rest of these negative um, issues? I believe it's all going to be focused around permission. And, um, and I think, obviously, we, we also heard from uh, Cindy Cave with the Board of Ed, so that's also up to the localities as well, local school divisions, to, um, to specifically come up with some um, uh, materials and training materials and uh, documents, which I believe are also already available. Um, as I'm looking at these negative uh, terms, under the age of 18, the code grants no permission for consent, for a minor to consent to sexual activity. And that's where I'm a little confused because now we're going to introduce the concept, the positive concept of consent or permission to terms that uh, are illegal. Domestic abuse, illegal, sexual harassment, dating violence, all of these are not Thank you. 
does not empower someone who's under 18 year old to legally grant consent. Mr. Chairman? <coughs> I think we, we're using the word consent because obviously in most cases high school students are old enough um, to conceptualize the term. It would be age appropriate, evidence based, as we talk about you know, using you know, examples. And obviously the examples and the programming for a ninth grader would be different than the tenth grader. Um, but um, I'm not sure, do you have anything to, to add to that? Does that answer your question as far as? <laughs> I should turn my words to the committee, if, if, if I may. I know it's, it's easy to make the association around consent and sexual activity, and it is true that there are some criminal statutes that criminalize certain behavior amongst amongst minors, but we're not just talking about um, sexual intimacy here. This is about teaching kids in age-appropriate ways how to express what they want, what they don't want, and giving them the tools to express their limits. And I hate to use this example, but I'm going back into the days when I was in high school in which someone might come up and grab somebody's ponytail from behind or um, pull their bra strap. You know, you want to give people the skills to be able to turn around and express that that is not appropriate behavior, or maybe they want to hold each other's hands, and that you just don't go grab somebody's hand, that you might ask, can I hold your hand? That is not criminal behavior. That is an expression of friendship. It can be an expression of something more than friendship, but that is a simple, loving, caring gesture, but it is appropriate to not just grab Delegate Philidor's hand, but to ask, may I hold your hand? So we're talking about th these are activities in, that our kids are involved in day in and day out in the negotiation of their relationships, not just intimate relationships, but friendships. And if they don't know how to do those things in the simplest of fashions in negotiating relationships, they are not going to do it well in intimate relationships. And so I would ask that you think about this broader than the concept of healthy intimate relationships and really looking at it from the building blocks of healthy friendships. <coughs> I have a delegate from London in the queue and then delegate uh, Lindsay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I understand where the delegate's going with this bill. I, I'm supportive of the concept. Uh, here's my concern is that just that word consent still not sure what it is that's absent in the current curriculum that would need to comply with everything else that's in line 19. So uh, with, uh, with my support for your bill and concept, but still needing, thinking it needs a little bit more clarification, I'm going to move to agenda items on the table. I have a motion to lay the bill gently on the table. Delegate Bell. I've got Delegate Bell and Delegate Head queued up here in that order. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my bill 1805 uh, would require each local school board that does not currently offer a full day of kindergarten uh, to have a plan to phase that in. Uh, currently in Virginia, full day care is almost a standard. There's only three counties in Virginia that don't have it. Uh, my home county being one of them, Loudoun, the other two are Virginia Beach and Chesapeake. Uh, 
the, uh, the issue with this is, uh, frankly, for a number of reasons, I think only kindergarten makes a lot of sense. The uh, SOL, the uh, standards for uh, kindergarten to say whether it's a half day or a full day. And uh, the, the half day students, uh, I know your experience in education and others, uh, with, with young children that uh, have to fulfill the same requirements, uh, take off coats and boots and gloves on winter days and get them back on. Uh, there's not a lot of time for instruction once you take that away. And our teachers are really uh, hard hit with, with having to uh, do the parent-teacher conferences for double the number of students. So uh, my feelings are uh, that, that kindergarten is almost what first grade used to be when I was in school. I've uh, been a pleasure to serve on the school readiness committee this, this past, uh, starting the past July. And uh, the big issue we looked at there is how to prepare children for school. And there's been a lot of discussion on universal pre-K. I would argue that the Commonwealth, well, I'm a, a big fan of early education. Uh, all the studies show that that's the best place to spend money. So we get the most bang for a buck. And I'd much rather spend money helping children succeed than spending two or three times as much to help children catch up once they're behind, uh, which also often involves esteem issues. Uh, full day kindergarten, I believe, uh, helps to do that. It also relieves a tremendous burden on parents uh, who are forced to shuffle around. In my county, the uh, average out for care before or after is about $1,400 per month. So it's a great deal of expense for people to, to deal with this. Again, there's only three counties, uh, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, Loudoun. Uh, the bill actually does not put a time frame on the plan. Uh, it, the plan would have to be done before next session. However, it doesn't mean that they can't do a 10-year plan, a 20-year plan. Uh, so they've got plenty of time to phase this in. The idea is we build new schools, we should build them with full-day kindergarten very costly to then go back and retrofit and add on classrooms. If we plan for this and we project it, we can do it in the most cost-efficient manner. There's also ways of phasing in full-day kindergarten, uh, multi-shifts and other things which school districts around the country have done, which don't involve building new buildings, but just greater uh, utilization of the current facilities. So I would advocate those kind of things, but bottom line is the plan has flexibility. Uh, but if we don't have a plan and we don't set that vision, uh, it's been we've been reluctant to, to in that direction. In Loudoun specifically, uh, I commend our school board and our superintendent. Currently about 50% of the students are full day kindergarten. They're hoping to move that up to as high as 80% next year. Uh, it's a fast, fast growth county and that's been one of the difficulties is meeting the new growth and getting the full day at the same time. However, I know in uh, the meetings that uh, we've had, pre-legislative meetings, myself and, and several other members of the delegation from both parties, uh, Senator Black, uh, for instance, Asked specifically how much it's going to cost to do full day kindergarten. What is your plan? I've asked that, Delphi Greason's asked that, and we've yet to get specific responses to those questions. Uh, it's difficult to set that vision and to project for it if we don't know what the plan is. So this requires a plan. Uh, the, uh, the last thing I'll say is again, I believe from a fiscal responsibility, uh, having the plan to do this and spending money on early education saves money later on. And again, helping children succeed early versus <coughs> spending money to help children catch up, I think makes more fiscal and moral sense. So Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to answer your questions, and I think there are some folks here to speak to Bill. Thank you, Elliot Bell. Anyone on the subcommittee have questions? Anyone in the audience wish to speak? Let me uh, just uh, preempt you a bit. Um, I have received word that this bill, because of the funding, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee, Jim Livingston, President of the Virginia Education Association, I think Delegate Bell makes the point quite clearly. We can either front end load the issue, or we are certainly going to pay for it on the back end. Research and evidence is clear. The earlier we can reach children and begin their, their formal education, the, the better chances they have at success. Uh, we, the BDA, are in full support of the bill. Uh, and it is also a matter of equity. We've got uh, children who are not being afforded the same opportunities um, as their um, counterparts in other parts of the Commonwealth. We stand in full support. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dean Federation of Teachers. Research, evidence, equity. That's three very important words in this discussion. We in Fairfax, uh, with uh, the board to implement uh, this, this program, Full Day Kindergarten. It took less than two years and it was under budget and uh, ahead of schedule. If the will is there, 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Uh, I'm John Sturrup. I represent the Lowell County Public School System. Uh, with respect to Delegate Bell, the uh, uh, Loudoun County Schools, uh, currently all students who receive free and reduced lunch are eligible for full day kindergarten. And as mentioned, they are moving toward full implementation. Uh, for a rapidly growing jurisdiction like Loudoun County, with over 75,000 students and a very large uh, capital improvement plan, uh, of micromanagement that comes from this mandate is, a, is an undue burden on the, uh, on the school division. So we would ask you to propose the bill. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, um, I'm John Costin, and I am representing the Chesapeake School Board and Public Schools. <coughs> um, we feel that this is needs to be kept on a local level. We do have a plan. Right now, it, it's, um, it's set out that we, we don't have facilities or the instruction um, that will allow us to do this. So um, I'm asking that you um, oppose this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Joel Landis, representing Virginia Beach Public Schools. And I, I don't know if we exactly have a position in opposition because our board is, in fact, voting today on a plan for Substitute motion to refer the bill to appropriations. I'll, I'll second that, Mr. Chairman. I'd probably time to speak to the motion. And properly seconded. Um, <coughs> we need to act on that. Uh, substitute motion to Delegate Melendez would seem to be the appropriate time. Yeah, the, uh, just to just, uh, Delegate Bell, I, I know what, exactly what, what he's doing. His district happens to be adjacent to mine in, uh, in Loudoun County. I think we, I think we all agree on what, what the goal is. It's a question of how to get there. And the, the concern I have about the bill is, is that it's, in a sense, contrary to House Bill 1498 that we passed unanimously to send it to uh, the Appropriations Committee, maybe it was one no vote, um, about class sizes. If you're going to compel a local school division, one that's rapidly growing and in the process of trying to build enough schools to do this now, you're going to have larger classes in the other grade. You've got to be able to fit all the kids in the school at the same time. And, that, and that's my concern. So I know we're going to get there someday, but I don't want to get there too fast and have someone call me from South Ride and say, why is there 38 kids in my, my fourth grade class? Mr. Chairman, if I could speak then. Yeah, we go. Yeah. I, I would say uh, I, I, I hear those concerns, and, and I know these are difficult decisions. Uh, other counties like Prince William, and I know the gentleman mentioned Fairfax, when they actually made the move, they thought it was so successful, they accelerated the plan from what they originally had. So uh, there are massive benefits to doing this. However, again, my bill doesn't give them a time frame to do this. So they have the ability uh, by extending the years of implementation where they don't have those problems. So, um, and to the school boards, you know, I understand where they're coming from opposing this, frankly. If I were in their position, I probably wouldn't want someone to, to oppose it on me either. Uh, however, you know, I'm, I'm a little frustrated because they've been trying to do this for years and we still don't have a plan. And, and that's why I believe we have to take action. Uh, the school board still will have the ability and <coughs> flexibility through a long-term plan uh, to exercise local control. We're not taking that away from it. We're just saying move in that direction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doug. We have before us a substitute motion to refer the bill to appropriations and properly seconded. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed? Bill 1914 uh, is a bill that was uh, 
brought to me at the request of a constituent who is a former school board member, and uh, it addresses an issue that uh, really I don't think had been considered much, and that is that school board members are granted absolute access to our schools. Uh, they are able to walk on the grounds into the buildings at any time, and yet anybody else that <coughs> has access like that has to be screened. Uh, if they're going to have a, open access, there has to have been a background check and a, a screening for that person. But the school board members themselves, perhaps an issue could exist where we would have some nefarious behavior on the part of somebody that could get themselves elected to the school board. Uh, I do have a constituent, uh, Reverend Tom McCracken, who is uh, as I said, a former school board member, and he is here, I think, would, uh, would like to speak to the board. Uh, let me see if there are any questions from the subcommittee, first of all. That was the money. I guess maybe uh, two questions for the patron, uh, if you wouldn't mind. Um, I understand the purpose of the bill. It's clear. No question about the objection. Um, what happens if someone's elected and then this information comes out afterward? Are they unelected or are they fired or what happens? I mean, does, does the election then invalid? I, I think we would have to have some, some clarification on that. But I think the reason, too, that it was put in the initial intent was this to be a qualification prior to running. Um, but that's not what the bill says. That's not what the bill says. My understanding, and the council can, can maybe clarify this, my understanding on that was that there would have been some constitutional issues with putting that in place. So this would, would probably call, it would need some, need some additional clarification on that. No, no, no. I just wanted to just constitutional questions with doing it after the fact. question, not a response, if I, I, I understand the point that, that uh, school board folks have virtually unlimited access to the schools, wouldn't it not make sense then to say you don't have unlimited access to the schools unless you do this check, just like a teacher would have to go through the check? That would seem to solve a problem without getting into what's a legal election or not. Solution. Uh, I think probably better light would be shed on this, though, from Mr. McCracken, if that would be all right, and, uh, and perhaps he might be able to give a little bit more clarification on this because he was a school board member, and, uh, and they might be able to shed some, some better light on that. Let's hear from Mr. McCracken. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you so much. My name is Thomas McCracken. Um, you know, as an educator, a former teacher, uh, current adjunct professor, um, as a former school board member, parent of support, obviously, in 1914. I think this will be uh, an effort to close this obvious and evident hole uh, in our security. Um, when I first started serving as a school board member, I was shocked to realize that I had more access to more facilities, to more children, uh, virtually unlimited. And, you know, to answer that question, um, sir, I, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, in, my, in my tenure, I did not experience a time where my job did not place me around children, even at central office not going out to the schools, you know, there were children all over the place all the time. So just in that capacity as a school board member, you are inherently around children. So I, I really think that, you know, the same requirement um, that we are asking all these employees to undergo from, you know, bus drivers to nutritionists to administration, um, that we should. So, you know, again, as I was serving in that capacity, I was absolutely shocked at all of that access, yet I was not required to undergo the same process specifically related to a background check that every other employee was. Yet again, I had more access to more facilities, um, to more children than almost everybody. Um, I had a card that could get me in any school at any time, any door. Um, and so to not have to undergo the same thing that the bus driver, you know, picking a child up with a very limited amount of time in a contained environment has to undergo, that was kind of shocking to me. So uh, I think this bill, you know, for the short term, to fix that solution, I voluntarily subjected myself to the process. As a, a newly elected school board member, I said, I want that background check. I'll pay for it. I'll do what we need to do. And I encourage the other school board members to do the same. The long-term solution was, of course, 1914. Uh, and I think this will serve a, a, a duality purpose, a uh, two-fold purpose. Number one, more, most importantly, it'll serve the security for our children. Uh, secondly, I think in this current culture and climate of violence and threats, I think it'll provide an assurance to the parents, to the grandparents, to the guardians, that everyone that interacts with their child are
our students during the course of their educational day will be cleared to the same level as everyone else. So, thank you. Kelly Perry. Uh, um, I understand the concept, I understand the concerns, and I'm a mother of five, grandmother to seven, but I'm also elected official, and so I'm wondering if there's anywhere where, you know, we have a list of qualifications to run for certain offices. Is there any list that exists for qualifications to run for school board that maybe we could say cannot be a felon? As far as checking the background, this, this to me, I have to question which elected office will be next that we have to have people fingerprinted and ID'd and go to the FBI to see if they can, can run for something. And so that's why I'm wondering, isn't there a better place to do this than have a requirement? Wouldn't there be a list of qualifications for a member of a school board? Tell me the money. Uh, I guess relative to that comment and my, my earlier comment, um, I can see a distinction between an elected member and an appointed member. We get into this question of qualification for election. I just wonder if there's a way we can amend your bill, maybe not at this moment, get exactly what you're what you're aiming for and maybe not, not get it confused with some of these issues. So I, I Mr. Chairman, I move that we maybe pass this by for the day and see if we can work this out with the patron. And Mr. Chairman, I think there are some I think there have already been some suggestions made from the dais and in checking with counsel here. I think there's some way that we can do that without having to leave this code section and uh, run the risk of a germanish issue. Uh, so Seconded. All in favor of taking the bill back for the day, please say aye. Aye, aye. Opposed? Y'all get ahead. We are meeting again Friday, one half hour after adjournment, and uh, we'll put you on the top of the list uh, if you can get everything fixed by then. I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Y'all get quiet. Let uh, me do a little housekeeping here. Yes, uh, Howard draws an eye. Delegate Lemonian and Delegate Bank, we will move you to Friday because I know you guys have to be there. And that way I can make sure you're there. Uh, Thanks, Blanche. I'm happy to be here Friday, too. And you will be numbers two and three. Okay. Delegate Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this bill, 2395, would uh, build on the uh, legislation that last year, before last, last year, uh, regarding training for teachers in identification and signs uh, of dyslexia and students at an early age. I would appreciate the subcommittee support on that. Uh, this legislation would uh, provide a point of contact, essentially, in each school division for teachers um, by ensuring that one uh, reading specialist in schools with <coughs> the reading specialists have the training know the appropriate interventions and accommodations and techniques for teaching students with dyslexia. Um, the language is fairly straightforward. Uh, it is not anticipated to have any kind of fiscal impact. Um, I know there's an updated this that <coughs> clarifies um, that if it is in those divisions that choose to have so
be a role there if they wanted to get the training, they could get the training and be that point of contact. As you see in the language, what we want is for someone to be able to answer questions in the school division. And so while the bill says one reading specialist, um, I think at the, the end of that line, line 71 is most important where it says, shall serve as an advisor on dyslexia and related disorders. So that in areas without uh, those reading specialists, that you would have an individual that could serve as that advisor. Steve? Okay, I think that clarifies. We're talking about just reading specialists having this extra ability for the district to be able to support others. Okay, I was in each school building. I thought, how are we going to do that? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Going back. I don't know if this is proper, but there's no one here to speak against the bill. I'm prepared to make a motion. Thank you for the expediency. Hold on just one second. I, I spoke to Kelly Klein about a possible friendly amendment to the bill. Uh, here's what I would suggest. Um, on line 69, uh, after board, insert a comma, and then the words, who is not employed as an administrator, comma. Seconded to report as amended. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Opposed, same sign. Bill reports. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, in the interest of time, uh, we have two bills we did not get to uh, Delegate Baggies and Delegate Remunions. Uh, we will take those along with Delegate Heads that we took by for the day. Friday, one half hour after adjournment, we will meet. February meet.